One great advantage which I enjoyed in my younger days was the literary and artistic atmosphere which pervaded our house. I remember how, when I was quite a child, I would be leaning against the veranda railings which overlooked the detached building comprising the reception rooms. These rooms would be lighted up every evening. Splendid carriages would draw up under the portico and visitors would be constantly coming and going. What was happening, I could not very well make out. But I would keep staring at the rows of lighted casements from my place in the darkness. The intervening space was not great, but the gulf between my infant world and these lights was immense. My elder cousin, Ganendra, had just got a drama written by Pandit Tarak Ratna and was having it staged in the house. His enthusiasm for literature and the fine arts knew no bounds. He was the centre of the group, who seemed to have been almost consciously striving to bring about from every side the renaissance which we see today. A pronounced nationalism in dress, literature, music, art and drama had awakened in and around him. He was a keen student of the history of different countries and had begun but could not complete a historical work in Bengali. He had translated and published the Sanskrit drama Vikram Morvashi and many a well-known hymn is his composition. I was still a child when my cousin Ganendra died in the prime of his youth. But for those who have once beheld him, it is impossible to forget his handsome, tall and stately figure. He had an irresistible social influence. He could draw men round him and keep them bound to him. While his powerful attraction was there, disruption was out of the question. He was one of those a type peculiar to our country, who, by their personal magnetism, easily established themselves in the centre of their family or village. I remember still better his younger brother, my cousin Gunendra. He likewise kept the house filled with his personality. His large, gracious heart embraced alike relatives, friends, guests and dependents. Whether in his broad south veranda or on the lawn by the fountain, or at the tank edge on the fishing platform, he presided over self-invited gatherings, like hospitality incarnate. His wide appreciation of art and talent kept him constantly radiant with enthusiasm. New ideas of festivity or frolic, theatricals or other entertainments found in him a ready patron and with his help would flourish and find fruition. We were too young then to take any part in these doings. But the waves of merriment and life to which they gave rise came and beat at the doors of our curiosity. I remember how a burlesque composed by my eldest brother was once being rehearsed in my cousin's big drawing room. From our place, against the veranda railings of our house, we could hear, through the open windows opposite, roars of laughter mixed with the strains of a comic song. We could not gather exactly what the song was about, but lived in hopes of being able to find that out sometime. I recall how a trifling circumstance earned for me the special regard of cousin Gunendra. Never had I got a prize at school, except once for good conduct. Of the three of us, my nephew, Satya, was the best at his lessons. He once did well at some examination and was awarded a prize. As we came home, I jumped off the carriage to give the great news to my cousin, who was in the garden. Satya has got a prize! I shouted as I ran to him. He drew me to his knees with a smile. And have you not got a prize? he asked. No, said I, not I, it's Satya. My genuine pleasure at Satya's success seemed to touch my cousin particularly. He turned to his friends and remarked on it as a very creditable trait. I well remember 
how mystified I felt at this, for I had not thought of my feelings in that light. This prize that I got for not getting a prize did not do me good. There is no harm in making gifts to children, but they should not be rewards. It is not healthy for youngsters to be made self-conscious. After the midday meal, cousin Gunendra would attend the estate offices in our part of the house. The office room of our elders was a sort of club where laughter and conversation were freely mixed with matters of business. My cousin would recline on a couch and I would seize some opportunity of edging up to him. Some days, cousin Gunendra would not be allowed to remain in any doubt as to the contents of my pocket. At the least encouragement, out would come my manuscript book, unabashed. I need hardly state that my cousin was not a severe critic. In point of fact, the opinions he expressed would have done splendidly as advertisements. Nonetheless, when in any of my poetry, my childishness became too obtrusive, he could not restrain his hearty ha-ha. One day, it was a poem on Mother India. And, as at the end of one line, the only rhyme I could think of meant a cart. I had to drag in that cart in spite of there not being the vestige of a road by which it could reasonably arrive. The insistent claims of rhyme would not hear of any excuses mere reason had to offer. The storm of laughter with which cousin Gunendra greeted it blew away the cart back over the same impossible path it had come by, and it has not been heard of since. My eldest brother was then busy with his masterpiece, The Dream Journey. His cushion seat placed in the south veranda, a low desk before him. Cousin Gunendra would come and sit there for a time every morning. His immense capacity for enjoyment, like the breezes of spring, helped poetry to sprout. My eldest brother would go on alternately writing and reading out what he had written, his boisterous mirth at his own conceits, making the veranda tremble. My brother wrote a great deal more than he finally used in his finished work. So fertile was his poetic inspiration. Eavesdropping at doors and peeping round corners, we used to get our full share of this feast of poetry, so plentiful was it, with so much to spare. My eldest brother was then at the height of his wonderful powers, and from his pen surged, in untiring wave after wave, a tidal flood of poetic fancy, rhyme and expression, filling and overflowing its banks with an exuberantly joyful paean of triumph. Did we quite understand the dream journey? But then, did we need absolutely to understand in order to enjoy it? We might not have got at the wealth in the ocean depths. What could we have done with it if we had? But we reveled in the delights of the waves on the shore, and how gaily at their buffetings did our lifeblood course through every vein and artery. The more I thought of that period, the more I realize that we have no longer the thing called a majlis. In our boyhood, we beheld the dying rays of that intimate sociability which was characteristic of the last generation. Neighborly feelings were then so strong that the majlis was a necessity, and those who could contribute to its amenities were in great request. People nowadays call on each other on business, or as a matter of social duty, but not to foregather by way of majlis. They have not the time, nor are there the same intimate relations. What goings and comings we used to see! How merry were the rooms and verandas with the hum of conversation and the snatches of laughter! Men still come and go, but those same verandas and rooms seem empty and deserted. We still meet for business or political purposes, but never for the pleasure of simply meeting one another. We have ceased 
to contrive opportunities to bring men together simply because we love our fellow men. When I look back on those whose ringing laughter coming straight from their hearts used to lighten for us the burden of household cares, they seem to have been visitors from some other world.